Chapter Four of The Column of Dust by Evelyn Underhill. The Day's Work. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Josh Middledorf. Petit à petit, il a pénétré un plus grand nombre d'éléments psychiques, les teignant, pour ainsi dire, de sa propre couleur. Et voici que votre point de vue sur l'ensemble des choses vous paraît maintenant avoir changé. Bergson Little by little he had penetrated a greater number of the psychic elements, regarded them for thus to discern with his own coloration. It was here that your point of view on the entirety of such things seemed now to have changed. Bergson, The Imminent Gifts of Conscience this one rift in the solid stuff out of which she had built her universe this hateful and inconsistent thing which her senses reported left constance poised solitary in the midst of terrific spaces all that she called reality had been shattered and only consciousness remained as a certain fact she had seen abruptly the insecurity of those defences which protect our illusions and ward off the horrors of truth she had found a little hole in the wall of appearance, and peeping through had caught a glimpse of that seething pot of spiritual forces whence, now and then, a bubble rises to the surface of things. There were beings there, living and full of horror because devoid of shape. She had opened a door for them, and now they could press in on her, and she, loathing their companionship, could not resist. All her robust and eager enjoyment of life fled from her. It was not real any more, only that invisible and intangible eternity behind the shadow show was real, that and its detestable inhabitants. She had one consolation. She felt herself to be unique in so perceiving the true proportion of things. Many teachers she knew had referred to it, but she shared the conviction of all other tasters of supreme experience that no one had seen reality face to face before. It made this poor, visible life seem futile, its discipline absurd, yet she was immersed in that life, and it pressed in on her, forcing itself on her attention in a peculiarly exasperating way. There were mysteries all about her, strange companions, a knowledge of some actual and densely populated world here at hand penetrating her own body perhaps as well as all objects of her thought yet vera's bath must be faced every morning and the shop that little universe where souls and bodies were but the material for a profitable distribution of the real things cloth leather paper and ink this state of things constituted a paradox which would have been amusing had it not been personal as she went to business in the morning, automatically dodging the motor omnibuses, staring out of her dream in amazement at the people who surged up in her path, all hurrying, all unreal, she repeated to herself continually, I have got to go on, I have got to go on. She came to the bookshop at the moment in which the last of the shutters ran up with a bang disclosing a window in which constance was accustomed to take a certain professional pride she gave it as she entered the scrutinizing glance which a good housewife bestows on the drawing-room curtains as she goes up her garden path the window was wide and uncrowded the loving amplitude of a museum not the tightly packed practicalities of trade it was never without its m s of the decretals its flemish herbals open at a page at once decorative and decorous burton's arabian nights placed discreetly in the background a cover in tooled levant from the dove's bindery or one or two of the rarer products of the kelmscott press within topography and scandalous chronicles jostled the ancients very comfortably upon the shelves there were also a few high-class remainders and several piles of cheap reprints for Lambton's was one of the many establishments which stand Janus-faced between culture and commerce. One quarter was devoted to current literature, reviewers' copies often uncut and always very cheap. 
Two tables stood in the wide space between the bookshelves. On one Mr. John Lampton arranged a permanent exhibition of book lovers' trinkets. Limited editions, pocket classics, neatly boxed marvels of limp lambskin and rough calf, Thomas a Kempis in twenty different dresses, all worldly, the wisdom of the East in American spelling, or the ballad of Reading Jail, clothed with a chaste absurdity in white. The other table, which was smaller, held large, unreadable colour-books, a few works on Italian painters, and new copies of such novels as Constance felt that cultured and bookish people ought to read. She looked up as she entered at that tightly-ribbed row of books on the shelves, little nests of words bewilderingly various. They were gay in the morning light and wide awake. She stared at them as one stares at abnormal shapes seeing them no longer as concrete things but as odd agglomerations of line and surface little nests of words ideas those evanescent wandering things caught and tucked up in paper as unruly children are tucked up in bed to open a book and let the soul of it gush out like perfume invading overwhelming the mind this was a daily miracle and she the purveyor of such miracles she had never thought of it before, but at this moment the mystery of it swept her, and with amazement that one should thus sell thoughts for money, since thoughts were real and money was not. How inconceivable an act to communicate the dream which came from the heart of Dante in three volumes limp green leather for six shillings net. In the face of this and all other paradoxes of her concrete life, she was suddenly infected with an unworldly bewilderment. She looked out with astonished vision on an incredible earth. All things were made new, for it seemed that she had abruptly acquired the innocence of eye, which we snatch so easily from our children, to give back so tardily and incompletely to our artists, poets, and saints. She took off her hat, assumed her blue linen overall, and sat down at her desk. The mirror was opposite to her. She raised her eyes, saw it, and at once the scene of the past night was recreated for her, the dusk and solitude, all the ceremonial absurdities, the perfumed smoke which was ascended like a white pillar, that other pillar of grey and shivering dust which had arisen from the floor, the urgent and tormented voice that had addressed itself to no earthly ear, fire and all the eternities evoked in a bookshop in that prison of a myriad cells the tangible and intangible worlds were swept up together in one heap of confused experience like the surging clouds in a crystal gazer's bowl but it was the invisible side that seemed homely and possible of comprehension the visible that was alien and remote when she questions herself she found nothing save the nervous upheaval caused by her late experience to account for this state of things. She was amazed by her own topsy-turvy condition, conscious of it and interested in it, but she seemed to have lost the useful art of taking things for granted. She stared at the strange new world of unmeaning color and shape and wondered why it should exist at all. Then Mr. John Lampton came through the glass door from his private room, and at once Constance became the normal businesswoman, the useful manager, the prudent and cultivated bibliophile. Mr. John held a catalogue in his hand. He was going to ask her advice, a circumstance much dreaded by Miss Tyrell, since it often compelled her to exhibit an intellectual superiority which prudence advised her to keep for the sole use of her customers. It's one thing to bandy Horace with old gentlemen, and another to improve inadvertently upon your employer's Latin pronunciation. Mr. Lampton had engaged Constance because an assistant who knew something about literature had become necessary to his peace of mind. He was one of those unfortunate persons whose short sight and aquiline nose suggest a culture which their conversation cannot endorse. In such a superior class of business as that of Lampton and Sons, 
this was particularly inconvenient for elseviers in the window are held to imply erudition behind the counter there was scarcely a day in which some customer did not embark upon a conversation which mr john was obliged to terminate in a sudden and sometimes tactless way the thing came to a head on the morning upon which a disgusted liturgiologist found dugdale's monasticon and heckel's monism side by side on the shelf labelled r c theology mr john stung by his client's contemptuous glance alarmed by his immediate exit felt that the services of a well-educated inferior had become no less necessary to commercial prosperity than to personal comfort and self-respect miss tyrell then found herself obliged to maintain a carefully subsidiary position whilst keeping a vigilant eye upon her employer's bibliographical aberrations she was rather glad to find that on this morning he wished to consult her about nothing more recondite than the romant of sir gawain the large paper edition of which had just gone into remainder mr john thought that it could be sold very profitably at one and six and he observed that it was fine large book for the money and if cased in velvet calf with ribbon ties would be singularly suitable for presentation you had better send an order to-day he said or else one of the other big houses will go and buy the lot when they come get them bound up and put aside for the christmas season they'll fetch half a guinea then but i think it's only a facsimile of the burdett manuscript answered constance not at all a book for general circulation middle english very difficult to make out and a good deal of curious matter in the notes mr john replied all the better looks cultured medieval and so on people don't want to read the books they give away constance wrote out the order in a spirit of disgusted obedience and then remembered how little such things mattered to one who had attained to the superb generalizations which characterized her present view of life this view had departed from her at mr john's entrance now it began to encroach by slow steps upon her orderly and busy mind she was enfranchised from that carefulness about many bibliographical things which usually obsessed her from nine to seven but she had only cast off one set of chains to assume another it was gradually borne in on her that her senses were no longer quite her own there was a thing which used them and she participated in that use but could not control it she leaned as it were over the shoulder of a new inhabitant and peeped out of the window with him so peeping she recognized a fellow victim of that impassioned curiosity that cold lust of knowledge which had urged her to all the adventure of life it seemed as though she out of the whole phenomenal world had attracted her antitype in the world of reality when she turned inward and asked the persistent presence why are you here he using perforce the language with which his hostess provided him could only answer i want to know all through life that had been her own need she respected it presently a customer who had been prowling happily in the recesses of the shop approached with a copy of balzac's conte de Rolatique. he had unearthed it from the dark corners where those books which are catalogued curious were usually kept and was turning it over with interest seeing a young woman behind the desk he hesitated but reflected that shop-girls share with nurses a certain immunity from the ordinary decencies of life and came boldly on this he said seems a very quaint uncommon sort of book most amusing too but it's well distinctly don't you know he thought for a moment came to the conclusion that his french was bound to be better than hers and added firmly Lubrique constance hardly readjusted to west london ideals answered him calmly and vaguely he writes entirely from the medieval standpoint puts everything down of course just as it really happens without leaving out the usual things but there's nothing uncommon in it really nothing but life the costume is different and the people are quite candid that's all modern married life in the suburbs is just as she was determined to give him his word again, just as lubrique. The customer looked at her with surprise and with a noticeable joyous anticipation. 
but her smooth black hair and solid figure did not suggest pleasantries. She added immediately, "'That copy is twelve and six. It's in very good state, and has all the Doré illustrations. I can give you another, with the margins rather cut down, for seven shillings, if you like, but it isn't such good value for the money.' The customer thanked her, and said he would think it over. He left the book lying on the desk, and Constance carefully reinterred it in its dark corner, returned to her ledger, and glanced at the clock. It was half-past twelve, and a quarter to one was the hour of the midday friend. Every prosperous bookshop has its gang of prowlers, who pay their footing by a purchase once in a while, but have their real commercial value for the establishment in the fact that they stimulate the prowling instincts of other passers-by. These may be persons of a nicer conscience than your true adept of the business, and feel that each delicious loiter and surreptitious bout of reading must be paid for, if only from the penny-box. The conscientious prowler, however, tends with the passing months to join the more professional and less lucrative class. It was the distinction of the midday friend that he had moved in the opposite direction, in that slow, unnoticed way which is peculiar to great constitutional changes, his visits had ceased to be an accident and had become an institution. There had been first the involuntary glance at the wide and open entrance as he passed, and then the momentary lingering to read a title or so, and then the day on which he had entered the shop in chase of a colour book whose vivid charms had forced its into remainder a little before the usual time. He had turned it over, looking with admiration at the blue trees and orange castles and the purple-margined peasants silhouetted against greenish skies. Then he had put it down with a sigh. <sighs> "'I'm afraid I must not take it,' he said. "'The truth is my wife doesn't like these books, and it vexes her to see them lie about. You see, she has made our house very artistic, whitewash and all that.' This statement at once aroused sentiments of interest and pity in Constance delightful and stimulating emotions which her customers seldom provoked. She conceived of this blunt, square, bullet-headed man, wholesomely animal, poised uncomfortably upon sparse and tasteful furniture, his very weight and virility an offence, his broad-toed boots always in the way, the constant society of a wife who condemned all that one thought ingenious and beautiful seemed a more lonely business than her own solitary lodgings, where there was, at any rate, no one to set up irksome and exclusive canons of taste. On his next visit she learned that his name was Andrew, a circumstance mentioned in connection with Scotland, the national thistle, and the animals which feed thereon. This form of humour seemed a relief to him. She divined that it was not permitted at home. She had laughed with such evident good humour and enjoyment that he could hardly fail to index her as the sort of woman who understands and appreciates a man. He bought a book. On the next day he returned, and bought another, with a pathetic air of trying to make his visits worth her while. In a week they seemed intimate friends. Upon this morning Constance looked forward almost hungrily to Andrew's visit, she turned toward the idea of his solid and unimaginative personality with that instinct for a counter-irritant which causes us to seek out our least appropriate acquaintances in seasons of grief. He did not want to be spiritual. He did not want to think. She saw at this moment much to commend in such a point of view. She loved her body, honored it deliberately as the medium of all great experience. The midday friend took the body seriously, was interested in the clothes which it wore, the games that were good for it, the things that one gave it to eat. His own body was excellently groomed, warm, efficient, and compact. He would have been shocked and puzzled by the suggestion that it really had something in common with a column of dust. For outside the pages of the burial service such metaphors were clearly morbid and absurd. He came. His, "'Morning, Miss Tyrell. Hope you're well. Beastly weather we're having.' At once satisfied her craving for honest ordinariness, but, to her surprise, he did not fidget in the usual way, flick the pages of the second-hand novels, or otherwise try to find a reason for his presence. 
he walked without hesitation towards the bookshelves and she found herself following him in the subdued but attentive attitude of the expert saleswoman for once it appeared there was a definite object in his visit it's my wife's birthday he said forgot all about it till i'd left the house this morning rather awkward i must take something home she's a curious woman you know childish in a way as many are although clever doesn't like these little things passed by seems to me i may as well give her a book as anything else she reads a good deal the right sort of thing of course it occurred to me that you'd be able to find me something she would like it had better be thoroughly up to date or else quite old-fashioned anything in between is no good constance successively suggested neolithic pantheism southern siberia the home of the soul and the duty of duties development of self but he thought that she was sure to have read all of those he wandered from table to table picking up books with an uncertain hand she liked the air of manly helplessness with which he confronted an intellectual choice clearly it was important that he should avoid any mistake women are queer he said one doesn't understand em not that one wants to for that matter but it's more comfortable not to do the wrong thing if one can help it if they really are women just that you can't do the wrong thing can you that's it said andrew eagerly that's what one wants em to be of course but they never are nowadays at least not in our set don't seem to understand what men want oh very nice to us do their duty and so on of course i'm not saying anything but clever and always worrying about it as if brains and women were a sort of disease i i beg your pardon beastly of me i forgot really you let me come chatting to you and sometimes one's tongue runs on constance was aware of something which picked up these utterances looked at them curiously and laid them by with a helpless air of non-comprehension but she resisted its companionship expelled it as it were from the neighbourhood of her mind and concentrated her will upon andrew and his interests his robust humanity called out hers to meet it he found her on this morning peculiarly sympathetic and never suspected that her unusual proximity of spirit was due rather to the repulsive powers of another than to his own attractive force he was greatly pleased by an expensive copy of browning's christmas eve printed in illegible gothic type with fantastic bloomers and bound in naked millboards held together by linen braid the binding he said is just right for our drawing-room so bare and simple couldn't be better but she wouldn't read it and i doubt if she'd even let it lie about you see browning from what i hear is just a bit gone by in our set and our old-fashioned books are worse to them than last year's clothes quaint isn't it the way things come and go when we were first married you know she got quite depressed because i couldn't stick him and now he goes on the top shelf with ruskin and george eliot and carlyle he was standing by her desk and having laid down the blatantly austere christmas eve he picked up a shabby duodecimo and began to flick its leaves gently and indifferently as he talked it was grand grimoire now here he said presently is a very rummy little thing i wonder if that would do i shall be late for lunch if i don't find something soon what is it magic eh that's quite a notion a bit out of the common i suppose she's not likely to have seen that one before hardly they are getting very scarce this is the first copy we have had for years he gazed vaguely at the queer woodcuts and strange garbled recipes as precise and unemotional as a cookery book queer notions those old chaps had look here to evoke the spirit of an angel the magic circle being drawn and the altar of incense prepared god bless my soul what next for to catch your angel eh oh i'll take this it will just suit muriel she's keen on spooks and things and she hates the point of view of modern science not much modern science here constance answered on the contrary if you know how to read its formulae this is modern science and the things that modern science hasn't yet got to 
Oh, come, said Andrew, humoring her. Modern science, you know, is practical, experimental, constructive, and so on. Well, so is this. It's just a series of scientific experiments, nothing else, and they are real enough and practical enough for those who know how to perform them. Goodness knows. Other people, of course, will find it about as enlightening as a collection of chemists' prescriptions, and about as dangerous, too, if they go meddling without authority. Yes, but vampires and spells and salamanders, you know, insisted Andrew. They're all here, taking themselves quite seriously. You're not going to tell me these are scientific facts, are you? We mayn't know much, but we are jolly well sure they don't exist. Well, you can't prove a negative. God bless my soul, what next? said Mr. Vince for the second time. Within his own mind, he added, she seemed such a sensible woman, too. He felt puzzled for a moment and slightly disheartened. It was the first time that they had disagreed. Then the word angel suddenly occurred to him and suggested that the queer little book might perhaps have something to do with religion, though it seemed on the surface to have more in common with Maskeline and Cook. There were so many new religions now. No doubt Miss Tyrell affected one of them, a circumstance which would explain her peculiar attitude at once. She might even be a Romanist. They believed a lot of various curious things. He became shy and careful, for it was an axiom with him that one should never disturb a woman's religion. They required it, poor creatures. As for Constance, she asked herself with temper, what on earth can have made me play the fool and talk to him in that idiotic way? For two pins I should have told him the whole affair. Of course he is disgusted now and thinks I am a superstitious rotter, and very likely that is what I am. Her manner became constrained and businesslike, confirming his suspicion that he had somehow shocked her by mistake. He paid for the grimoire and retired in a mood of contrition, Constance wrapped it up in brown paper and tied thin green string about it with a certain relief. She still had a vague idea that in the absence of all exciting suggestions it might be possible to banish the humiliating memory of her experiment and of the tiresome hallucinations which it had induced. But the protective influence of humanity seemed to have departed with her friend, and a puzzled voice which she was learning to recognize murmured in her ear, it is also very funny, but what does it mean? And once more she looked out on a world which had become strange to her, inconceivable, grotesque. End of chapter 4